Archambata, Ma Ayanai Gonna Suk Cyberpunk Red, True True Cyberpunk 2050, Ne, TLDR It Diao, Crassus Son Well Well, mm, No Like CP3, <laughs> And Yet, Well Well for the Old Boy, Ne, And Now Now, Let's Peep. <laughs> Bitch, where's my money? If you want to help me out, you can subscribe to me on Patreon, which is Grimachu, on Subscribestar, which is Grim Jim, or if you want to make a one off donation to help support me and keep the channel going, you can do so at paypal.me jdesborough. Thanks. As you may have guessed from the amount of cyberpunk content <laughs> that I've done, around the quick start guide and everything else and that's a sort of primer for cyberpunk for people who were interested in the computer game i am hyped for cyberpunk 2077 and i've been hyped for cyberpunk red though not quite as hyped as i am for the computer game <laughs> i couldn't wait uh, and i couldn't read it as a pdf so I pre-ordered it, got my bits and mortar free PDF and had a hard copy printed and bound. Uh, and I've read through that. So I now ha will have a, a nice extra reference version that I can give to players to spare the main book when it arrives. The release date seems to be a bit different here in the UK. But uh, yeah, I got a copy I could go through properly and read in depth without quite so much eye strain. It's a big book. It's nearly 500 pages, and I really question whether it needs to be. The original Cyberpunk 2020, which had pretty much everything you need to run a game, made much more efficient use of space, even in the later editions with the additional art and so on. And a lot of the design space within Cyberpunk Red seems to be wasted. If you've read The Witcher RPG, which has a lot of problems, um, there's a similar layout problem in terms of Cyberpunk Red. In some ways it's more readable, in others it's less readable. It feels like it's been designed by someone who's more used to GUIs than they are to, to tabulating and laying things out in a, in a book format and given the involvement of CD Projekt Red may, maybe that's understandable there's a lot there I, just, I don't know that it all needs to be there and I don't know that it all needs to be padded out quite so much it's, it, it's nice to have but I'm kind of I'm over these 500 page heavy hardback books um i'm just i'm just over them <laughs> it's, uh, there is value to be had in boutique games but they're not especially accessible quite expensive quite heavy to carry around i mean not expensive compared to computer games and so on uh, but still um more and more i'm coming to appreciate palladium's model of doing big cheaply produced softback books <laughs> but ah, that's a matter of personal taste Weirdly, it retains a lot of the more dated elements. If you go back and you look at Cyberpunk 2020, some of the ideas and so on in that are odd to the point where it now becomes more like an alternative history book and setting rather than a, a near future cyberpunk setting. So the Neo-Soviets, for example, it's not. It, it just doesn't seem credible at this point that the Soviet Union or any version thereof could rise up. I think if we look to Russia today or if we look to other fiction that has tackled possible future Russias like the kleptocracy in Nikolai Dante, if we look at the way Putin handles things, so a dictatorship and rule by criminal elites, um, you know, plutocrats, money men, that seems far more likely than a return to Soviet values. In fact, you look at the few people who are keeping the, the flag flying for Soviet ideals in Russia and they just look kind of sad in a similar way 
to those that fly the stars and bars in the United States can seem kind of sad. So that's kind of glaring. Um, the timeline is kind of kind of glaring, and you kind of wonder why, if you're going to do a soft reboot, why not rejig all of these things really? Um, normally, I'm against that sort of thing, but here it's it's just really glaring. I also don't know why they went for an intermediary period between 2020 and 2077 because with the game coming out that is the world that people want to expand on and play in. I can understand bridging the gap with lore and timeline and background data and so on but not actually presenting anything to do with 2077 just feels off and like a missed opportunity. So that's kind of an, an overall vision of it. If we look, start looking into the mechanics of things, roles have been made looser. You can multi-class. Uh, Cyberpunk always had these roles as sort of classes, but not really. And most groups that I ever knew said that you could mix and match the, the specialist role skills. And this is now codified and present in the book. But at the same time, the roles have been made more like classes in that the special abilities have a much broader range of, of applicability and in fact are subsystems that give your characters particular specialist skills and capabilities. Some of this is welcome because med techs, cops, corporates etc got the, got the short end of the stick in the older games especially compared to something like a solo whose innate bonus from combat sense really made them monstrous in most situations <laughs> compared to the other roles. Most people, it seemed, only really played solos or netrunners, and anyone that chose to play the other roles for any reason was really missing out on a, on a lot of opportunity. Um, so that's been addressed, which is good, and it's opened it up so you can multi-class but at the same time you're being channeled more into the roles by these new special capabilities. There's an extended life path um, but it's not expanded enough. Maybe a separate book, something more like Central Casting, if you know those old books that would, that would be good. And parts of the life path are individuated by your role and class which further divides and channels you into a particular class which is a bit of an odd choice you don't roll stat by stat anymore you have stat blocks and from one method you roll a d10 and then you just read across and put those plug those stats into your sheet and they no longer run from 1 to 10 they run from 2 to 8 and there is no way explicitly or obviously laid out in the book other than cybernetics to raise those statistics once you're in play. So you get these sets of stats rather than individuated roles and you cap out at about 60 for a starting character. An alternative if you wanted to do rolled stats, if you're a bit more old school in that way, uh, might be to roll 1d8, add 1 and anytime you get a 9 just take that extra point and add it wherever you want as, as some sort of alternative. Now this has plus sides and minus sides, it's not as easy to start out as a super competent character, but it does mean that you explicitly have something to, to grow into, and this is even more the case when it comes to skills, uh, because you have caps to your starting level skills and your role skill starts at 4. So you don't have quite so many characters starting out with really high levels in any particular skill. Which again is, is good one way in that you always have something to grow, bad in other ways in that it's a lot harder to make a truly effectively competent character from the get-go. Humanity is now taken as a more sort of general sanity score to the degree that I think they probably should have renamed it. Um, and you can lose humanity for experiencing or undergoing traumatic events and so on. They've also addressed some of the 
supposed issues around humanity and cybernetic augmentation and changing your appearance and so on you may remember there was a bit of a fuss about that in that um, people felt it was dehumanizing to trans people or to people who have replacement limbs and so on <sighs> there are psychological effects when it comes to losing a limb or having an artificial limb um, yeah this this is well recognized they kind of dodged around it a bit by saying that if you're replacing something that was lost or you're affirming your identity then you don't lose humanity which is fair enough in so, in so much as it's fair enough but it does kind of rather undermine one of the the central points of cyberpunk as a genre in that you're trading technology for humanity becoming less human uh, over time um, and, and it's unfortunate to the extent that it's been undermined though I'm not too upset about it I can appreciate where they're coming from and it makes makes some sense but maybe you could do it in that if you lose a limb you lose some sanity rather than humanity and then you can restore some of that by getting a replacement limb one big departure in Cyberpunk Red and one that I really do not like is hit points Hit points are too abstract, it's just a bad idea, and I much preferred the approach that was undertaken in both Cyberpunk 2013, the original black box that I bought from Games Workshop, <laughs> which, which dates me back when they used to sell RPGs and didn't used to throw you out for discussing them, and in Cyberpunk 20 where you had wound levels. In Cyberpunk 2013 it was much more like the silhouette system where your damage was compared to your body and that told you whether you got a flesh wound, a serious wound, critical wound or mortal wound and in Cyberpunk 2020 you had essentially four points per level if you took more than eight points then that limb was ruined or destroyed or you were taken immediately to mortal wound um, your body type modifier reduced, reduced the damage and then you went down level by level uh, which was a bit deeper again you had flesh wound, serious wound, critical wound, mortal wound and then the mortal wound stacked up. It was just a, a much easier way of following things, a bit like a, a hybrid between hit points and, say, the storyteller system's wound levels. Hit points is just it's too abstract. It's, it's a step backwards, not a step forwards. It's simplified, which some people might like. It's more familiar to people who are more familiar with, say, Dungeons & Dragons or whatever. And it used a rule that I have used in my old school games half inch from fourth edition D&D where once you lose half your hit points that's where you get the penalty but a minus two penalty really isn't isn't too much <laughs> you do have proper critical hits now they don't come about from rolling a 10 and absolute botches don't come about from rolling a one which was a bit of a problem with the old system instead it's when you're rolling damage if you get two sixes, then on top of the damage that you do, you do a critical wound, provided you do some damage at least, and then there are critical hit tables. So that's okay, but it kind of limits what you can use in terms of weapons, and it limits backwards compatibility to older editions of Cyberpunk, where some of the bigger weapons did D10s of damage. So like the anti-material rifle, I think, did 6010 plus something. So a way to fudge around that and represent how the older weapons are much more effective and deadly might be to say if you roll two or more 9 or 10s on any weapon that does 1d10 damage or several d10 damage then you know, that, that would be a way to do it or allow them to do criticals if they get a, a 10 on any of their rolls or a 9 or 10 on any of their rolls so you can retain the backwards compatibility or you can substitute 2d6 for 1d10 though that becomes a bit more bit more deadly <laughs> but still just hit points doesn't doesn't jive with what's supposed to be a, a more modern techno thriller near future hard gritty game to me at, at, at least it doesn't to me death saves are pretty much the same as they always were once you're reduced to zero hit points you start making death saves and if you take additional damage or you fail to save over the turns you, when you die but the penalty goes up each turn you don't get stabilized yeah not much difference there 
skills are largely familiar to anyone who's played any of the previous editions of Cyberpunk. In the main book, the weapons kind of feel pretty generic. You've got mostly generic stats apart from the exotic weapons. Kind of a shame because hyper-consumerism, shopping, getting stuff for your character always used to be a big engaging thing in Cyberpunk. I mean, okay, not so much until you got to the Chromebooks, perhaps, but even so, I think it just doesn't present one of the immersive things about Cyberpunk when you genericize everything. Armor has no stacking rules, uh, though you could import the revised stacking rules from Cyberpunk 2020 and that would work fine. That's always been an issue in any game, really. The stopping power of the armor is much compressed from 2020. It's not a direct one for one comparison or even a two for one or a 1.5 for one. It seems to be a sort of varying scale. Uh, but it does mean that weapons tend to get through armor a lot more, which was a problem in 2020. <laughs> but combined with the hit points, it also presents these, these problems and issues around the game. Again, with the class emphasis, you get a certain amount of stuff and a little bit of extra money uh, according to your class and skills are largely chosen for you when you're creating a character. Just kind of eh. Uh, there's an underexplored concept which is the agent. So if you think about a more powerful version of Alexa or Google Assistant or whatever else, but not quite as powerful as the um, sort of semi-AI companion in the newer Blade Runner. An agent is kind of like that. It's like a digital secretary or a, or a daemon that handles things for you, searches, can give you advice on what's fashionable and trendy and, and so on. I think that could have been gone into in more depth. And I, I think algorithmic fashion would start to be a problem as we've seen how algorithms can definitely screw up social media searches and, and so on as well. Um, it, it just needs a bit more thought. But I don't think it would take too much to give it a bit more thought. And agents are quite limited, but if you look at something again like Alexa or, or whatever else, you can buy skills for it. So how about having something like that for your for your agent? Um, giving it a bit more, a bit more personality, and so on. A lot of the cybernetics in the game are relatively depowered, but then I expect we'll see that expand in source books and so on as they come along, and you know the shopping thing will become more part of the game again as that becomes uh, more obvious. Um, but there's nothing to stop you customizing, and the specialist skill of the tech. The, the character class lets you customize gear um, so that's an, an interesting aspect and makes the tech far more worthy as an addition to the team because they can essentially buff everyone else's gear and cybernetics with, with some good roles so that that's nice to see when it comes to combat you have a very limited two actions per turn uh, move and attack for some actions you get additional attacks so like uh, melee and hand-to-hand -hand attacks you get two for one but it is rather limited and may well slow down combat as you take your actions to prep your weapon blah 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 and 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 so on so it'd be interesting to see how that goes but i think it may well make combat a bit more disjointed in this version of cyberpunk where things used to be a lot more fast and loose but that may just be the way my group's interpreted it um, speaking of melee and hand-to-hand -hand, they have their oddities not only that you get the extra attacks but that they discount armor to an extent if you're using martial arts or weapons not so much if you're using brawl martial arts you've got some specializations there uh, with some special moves that go with different styles that's nice we'd like to see that expanded on in the same way it was in the Pacific Rim source book for the older edition, um, but it just feels odd <laughs> to ignore certain parts of armor if you just happen to be using a dagger or a blade or or a fist when that really should depend on what kind of armor. If you're trying to punch through Metal Gear, 
it's just it's just not gonna work <laughs> really or shouldn't work but maybe we'll see some differentiations and some melee specialist armor or something later on uh, that that would be welcome difficulties in most things tend to be lower than before by between two to five points which means you don't get that nice intuitive five difficulty sort of breakdown you know 10 15 20 25 30 being something that's considered impossible under most circumstances um, it's understandable why because the stats have been lowered and how competent you can be as a starting character has been lowered but it does remove a certain amount of elegance from the system vehicle combat is peculiar it's like it's been imported without consideration right so a person typically has a few tens of hit points but so does a vehicle <laughs> so and a vehicle probably has less hit points than you do if you're an even moderately competent character so you'll find that a gunshot that will not kill a person or even seriously wound a person can completely take out a car without being specifically aimed at the engine block or the tire or whatever else um, I think that needs looking at <laughs> quite quite severely one way to fix it and the the damage and protection for cover as well might be to take a tenth of the structural damage points of the vehicle or, or the structure whatever it is maybe then double it and use that as stopping power for the cover or the vehicle to give them a bit more longevity or to double or even triple the SDP scores of the vehicles or to give all vehicles an inherent base level stopping power of 5 or, or 10 uh, more for, for military vehicles but it just feels like someone someone forgot <laughs> to revise and update the vehicle rules it's uh, un yeah unfortunate so the role skills are interesting in that they are expanded and more specialized but they also become more complicated for example solos can which is the the combat class really they can customize the way they spend their points combat by combat so if you have say um, combat sense 5 or whatever they call it now uh, you could sink some points into damage deflection increased initiative um, countering fumbles that you might roll bonuses to attack extra damage perception bonus so you're gonna have that that point at the start of a combat where the person who probably should be going first is gonna have to divvy up their points and figure out what bonuses they want for the for the combat that they're about to engage in I mean it's nice to have that level of customization but if you're doing it on the fly then I, I don't think that's as, as helpful what you could do is allow solos to customize once and once only <laughs> um, spend their points as they get them in these various bonuses and then just leave it at that without customizing it combat by combat as I covered techs have become very worthwhile med techs have become very worthwhile because of their capability to customize and produce gear um, so yeah they can basically buff the rest of the team and, and that's something cool so mostly that's pretty positive I do have some criticisms however more particularly with regard to the background and the least believable part of what has happened in cyberpunk red is the downfall of the net that is the worst and least believable thing about it and it means that there would be much less of a global culture no real internet culture and yeah, this is perhaps the hardest thing of all to, to grapple with in the game because it's outside of most people's experience at this point anyone born after 1990 is not really going to be familiar with a world without the internet um, and for people who were early adopters like myself it's very difficult to get out of a mindset in which the internet exists so rather than having an international internet with information freely flowing from place to place you have these individuated national and city nets in reality in real life even the damage done in the cyberpunk background would not take out the net 
and it's simply too valuable for people to leave it without fixing it or replacing it. These individuated city nets would rapidly get connected to each other resulting in a new net and considering this is quite some period after all the disasters it just beggars belief that that hasn't happened yet. It's, it's hard to swallow. Even taking into account Raish Bartmos and his Raybids, which were semi-AI systems that basically ravaged the entire net and, and killed anyone that was on it, it's hard to believe that that would continue. We were talking about, very roughly, 25 to 30 years after that happened that we're playing in, in Cyberpunk Red and even more so in, in 2077. Think back to what computer programs were capable of, the hardware, the software, 25 to 30 years ago. And, well, I mean, the first virus was what? Um, Creeper in 1971. I think that was an unintentional virus, uh, uh, an emergent virus. What it is, it, it filled up people's hard drives. Do we, do we really think that today's antiviral software couldn't deal with a virus from 1971? <laughs> so why couldn't the AIs that were living in the net, you know, the other AIs, the transcendent and superhuman AIs that were already in the net in Cyberpunk in the 2020s, why wouldn't they be able to deal with the rabids? Why wouldn't a programmer 10, 15, 20 years later just be able to wipe away the rabids rapidly. You think how quickly viruses get deconstructed and solved now, it just makes no sense for this to happen. It also makes no sense for the old net to still be running if it has been abandoned and shut down because where is the power coming from? Where is the connectivity coming from? Uh, it, just, it just really doesn't seem to work for me. So if I am going to run a campaign, I think one of the central bars of that will be restoring the net. I mean, one thing you could do is you could go back to the 2013 uh, IG integrations, like Tronic, and uh, there was a version that rendered the net as a dungeon and so on before it was all unified. And it's the unified version, I'm getting deep into the background here, but it's the unified version that Raish Bartmos was involved in that allowed him to backdoor and crash the entire net and unleash the rabids and all the rest of it. Anyway, the point is that's really, really, really hard to swallow. Also hard to swallow is the lack of augmented reality as something for everybody. This is something that was explored before augmented reality was really well known in Cyber Generation, uh, which was set around 2027, I think. Um, and the Eden Cabal, Alt Cunningham and the rest of the sort of named characters looked after people who had been infected by the Carbon Plague which gave them weird nanotechnology related powers. Where are they? Did this happen? Because the Carbon Plague happened, but did Cyber Generation happen? Because there were some really cool ideas and ways of doing things in Cyber Generation from genuine smart guns to augmented reality and it's much more similar to the view of the net that we see in Cyberpunk Red. So did that happen? What's what what's the story what's the story here? And why isn't augmented reality available to more people than netrunners? And while I appreciate the desire to place netrunners in the action to have them have to physically infiltrate the buildings in order to run their hacks and so on you can do that without destroying the old net. You can just say that corporations and so on have become much more paranoid, use private networks, you know, air gapped, all the rest of it. A lot of things that already happen in security to stop people hacking while retaining the broader, um, more open internet. You know, you don't have to get rid of the whole thing to get the requirement to be on site or to use localized field effect hacking or to have augmented reality as being more important when it comes to um, comes to raiding corporations and so on. It's just a, it's just all a bit all a bit peculiar. Um, one thing that really leapt out to me out of the background, uh, apart from the net crash and everything, was that 
the Wasting Plague killed a few hundred thousands of people over the course of a few years and is shown to be part of what aided and pushed the collapse of society. But when you compare that with COVID, which has just in the US killed over 250,000 people in one year and hasn't led to total societal collapse, it's unfortunate. Maybe, maybe that needs a rewrite. Maybe it should have killed millions over several years. Just saying, it's meant to be a dark future. One other thing that I kind of like but kind of don't and I'm considering whether it actually makes sense. One thing I really liked about old cyberpunk is it really invested in the idea of going into orbit, the habitats and so on. You know, kind of just, just short of the expanse sort of level. And the exploration of orbital culture and so on was fascinating, but it was still reliant on most particularly the European Space Agency for a lot of its technology and a united federal Europe, which I'm a fan of the, uh, the idea of, was very much the center of high technology outside of Japan and culture and so on, and was really heavily investing in space. That's been taken away and it feels somewhat arbitrarily in order to create an Afrofuturist sort of idea. I'm not that convinced that Pan-Africa will really emerge as a, an, a major political force in the coming years. I think it will eventually. I think places like Nigeria are hot on the heels of China and India as sort of up-and-coming economies. But I don't think we'd be there yet by the time of Cyberpunk Red. And I would much rather that this all happened as part of the campaign and a story seeds within the world to see Africa becoming becoming ascendant um, than have it be done in such a it, such an arbitrary and background sort of way. I mean, some of it happened in the old uh, Stormfront and so on campaign, but it just. Um, it feels a little crowbarred and could have done with a little bit more massaging and attention because the corruption is just so utterly endemic in African nations and aid and development money doesn't tend to get down to the people. So it's a bit of a problem. And when we're talking about the African diaspora into orbit within the background of the game, it's great and all but it's just not that easy to take over systems and so on away from the people who actually make them, I don't think. Plus, or orbitals have the high ground and artillery, but it really doesn't take that much to wreck orbit. We already have a problem with debris and so on in orbit. Uh, the ESA, ironically enough, is engaging in technology to try and clean up orbit. But if you can just get a single missile on the right vector into orbit and shatter it, you can cause a cascading effect that would annihilate every orbital settlement and habitat outside of the Lagrange points. And the high ground always has somewhere higher. So I don't think the orbitals are stopping people from launching into orbit satellites and, and whatever else. And it's very easy to weaponize even just a basic satellite. So it just it, it doesn't quite hang together. I like the idea of Afrofuturism done properly. Uh, I like the the idea that being based on the equator becomes hugely important when it comes to orbital and space technology and so on. Love all of that. I just don't think the execution is quite there. And it feels kind of arbitrary and in the background when it would be much more interesting to address and deal with directly. So that's really about it. Um, there's a lot to recommend it. And I have very few gripes and they tend to be stylistic ones or things I can easily house rule away uh, as and when I want to or things that I can address in a campaign that I run, which I quite want to do. Maybe running online games again, don't know. Style, for a game that is style over substance, it certainly has a lot of style, but there are problems with the readability and the layout. 
and the gooey style design. I understand what they're trying to do, I just don't think they quite pull it off. So style four, substance, it's got everything you need and I'm being really nitpicky when I say that there isn't really enough material to buy and shop and, and so on. So I think I will have to give it, as a, as a truly complete RPG in one book, uh, 5 out of 5 for substance, because my, my nitpicks are just nitpicks. So that's a total of 9 out of 10, or 4.5 out of 5. Definitely worthwhile, and far superior to Shadowrun. Keep your fucking elves out of my cyberpunk. Zang. the grim dark depths of a grim dark mine there's a grim dark man with a grim dark mind and his grim dark pen spends its grim dark time scratching grim dark tales for his grim dark kind